Hi everyone and welcome uh, to another 15 Below webinar. Um, today we're discussing automation, so from human to machines, how to plan for automation. Uh, I have with me uh, a panel, so just to introduce myself, I'm Al Tradenic, I'm the Business Development Manager here at 15 Below, so I look after new customers coming on board and deal with our partnerships. Hi everyone, my name's Neil Chalk, I'm Product Manager here at 15 Below and I help airlines and travel companies automate their processes. And finally, uh, it's Rachel Passant here. I work with both Al and Neil, and I am the product marketing manager here at 15 Below. Thanks, everyone. So, today we're going to be looking at a few things. We are going to, first of all, we're going to start off with a presentation from Rachel about sort of why now is a good time to automate. Um, we're going to look through things like the return on investment for automation. So, automation is a great thing, but you know, actually building a business case for that. Um, practical steps and what you can do to plan uh, to get into automation projects. Um, talk about more a bit about the, the automate, automation as a subject and the five levels of automate, uh, automation and then um, we're going to get into some next steps. So before we get into the actual content, just a bit of explanation about uh, 15 Below uh, and who we are. Um, we are a very specialist company based in the UK, um, we, uh, although we have offices in Sydney and Lithuania as well. We help airlines, travel management companies and rail companies to automate processes. So we create very complicated workflows that automate communications and customer service uh, for lots of different um, things from booking confirmations to disruption, um, cross-sell and upsell ancillaries. Um, check-in processes, all sorts of things. We do that for about 50 clients worldwide. Um, most of those clients are quite large airlines and they're looking for automation processes because the volumes they need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly in disruption, are just too high to do in a manual way. Um, across those customers, we think we look after about 650 million passengers. And to give you an idea of why automation is so important to us, uh, we as a company are about 100 people. And the users of our system across all those 50 clients are probably no more than 1,000. And yet we manage to very uh, carefully and with a lot of detail provide very good personalized communications out to those 650 million passengers. So you can see how it'd be a very uh, cost-effective and constructive way of organizing things. The way we do all of these messages is through integration with different data sources, by um, providing a lot of consultancy and workshop with our customers to uh, map out workflows and map those into the system. And what we're effectively doing is taking what a customer service agent would do, or a res agent, um, and we're mapping their workflows, their thought processes into the system so that each passenger gets uh, a nice personalized message at just the right time. They can give feedback on decisions that have been made, um, we can track it and um, it means that not everything has to go through the call center. Um, when we talk about the messages we send, we send out across all channels, so email, SMS, automated voice, um, app push, social messaging platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll continue to add new channels on as they come in. We believe you need to be agnostic about uh, which channels you use because different customers in different regions will prefer different things. Um, here's a list of our clients. We'll be sharing this um, presentation later on, so if you want to download and look at it, we have a very good relationship with all of our clients, so if anyone would like to talk to anyone in our community of clients, please let me know. So, uh, to talk a bit about why now is a good time to look at automation, I'm going to hang over to Rachel. All right, okay, so uh, it's just a quick intro section really, just to put into context why we're looking at automation, why our business um, has been helping airlines or how our business has been helping airlines and travel management companies around the world to become a lot more efficient. Um, so you might be wondering why automation is that important. Well, if you look at uh, the information that's coming through, Um, so you might be looking at um, a lot of the information coming through from the from the travel media 
we all know that there are more people and more ways to communicate with them than ever before. It was only about 10 years ago that most people were communicating through the realms of email, SMS, it would be voice based. Um, and they were the primary ways in which to contact people. Today, obviously, everybody knows that the list is endless. Um, anything from Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, depending on which market you go around the world, people will have different ways in which to consume information and in which to, you know, the way that they prefer to receive information from businesses and from each other. So getting the information into the hands of your customer really means dynamically adapting the channels that you use. Um, and that might come from your marketing strategy um, to the context of the message that you're sending. So for example, if you're sending information to somebody that's on holiday in Maldives, are they really going to be picking up their email or would a text message be more suitable? Just thinking along those lines. Now, obviously none of that is possible on a manual level as the proliferation of communica communication channels continues. Another well-versed reason for automation is around capacity. It's no secret that with population growth and the opening of borders with the growing middle class and emerging markets, there are far more people traveling today than ever before. Um, airports and airlines are having to grapple with more and more people running through their buildings. They don't necessarily have uh, the capacity within their infrastructure. So it's about getting people from A to B as quickly as possible without causing the stress and the cues that are, that are obviously a byproduct of that. So scaling operations and increasing efficiency is really imperative to survival. Meanwhile, travel disruption continues. Um, whether you could argue it's to do with climate change or whether it's just a standard strike, a standard storm, because there are obviously more people traveling, it does impact a lot more people. Um, and with increasing importance around customer experience, it's about all, all around brand reputation um, and it's about protecting what you do uh, and how you manage your passengers during times of stress. So managing disruption at scale is obviously a huge benefit of automation. This slide is really just building on that idea around changing consumer expectations and consumer behaviours. This is a snapshot to illustrate how machines and self-service is fast becoming the norm. Passengers are used to working with technology and expect information at their fingertips. So a manual approach, again, no longer meets their needs and their expectations. And another reason why automation is key. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, it's been consistently reported that Companies that put customer experience at the core and at the heart of their business financially outperform those who don't. Um, so if your customer wants a personal touch in real time, every time they communicate with you, automation is really the only, only solution. In summary, um, so this is just really to summarize all of those points, passenger numbers are increasing. You have the airports there, but not necessarily the airport space isn't actually growing. We need more efficiency at every point of the customer journey. Um, and as customer demands are becoming more and more complex and their expectations around the experience that they desire continue to grow, we really need to move away from the manual operations that we've seen of yesterday and continue to progress into a more automated world. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'll just quickly take you through some of the factors to consider when um, looking at your return of investment. And these will actually help you later to actually plan the automation that you need to do. So the first aspect to consider is the actual process. Um, and hopefully it should be quite straightforward as to why this will help you plan. Um, so before you actually start to think about what you're automating, you kind of really need to know about what in the process is currently taking your time. Um, what are you unable to do because of this? I mean, sometimes processing 
time constraints can actually mean that you don't contact everybody, for instance, in a schedule change scenario. Also, it's important to know at what stage is the largest amount of data handled and by whom, because if you're having to pass that data all around, um, it can not only be time consuming, but you've got security concerns. And these are the kinds of things that computers are very good at uh, dealing with. And finally, what could people be doing instead? Um, and is that more valuable? Is it more valuable to your company that you've got people in a call center selling things? Or do you want them to do the customer service calls? I mean, there's arguments for both there, but it's important to understand for your business, for the people that you've got, what could they be most valuably doing with their time? The second kind of aspects are actually more about the um, different parameters inside the, um, the process that you can then use directly to calculate the ROI. So for instance, um, the number of packs, and if you know the average number of outbound and inbound communications, you can then kind of quite quickly scale that up to um, see time savings. Cost savings for the um, call centers and the staff. Again, if you know the the volumes that you've got on those inbound and outbound communications, you can see what impact that will have. Again, the time savings. Um, if your staff aren't doing activities which are slightly less profitable and they're doing something more profitable, what benefit will that have to the business? This is an interesting one. Um, quite a lot of our communications and automation we put in actually put information in people's hands so they don't need to um, follow up with simple inquiries. And that kind of proactive communication actually has or can have quite a large effect on your bottom line. So it's worth looking at the volumes that you've got at the moment in your call center, for instance, or that your ground handling staff are having to field. They're actually quite simple queries that you could proactively give people the information. There's also the cost of informing or compensating or even just logging claims during disruption. Could these be automated away so that you can actually just get people processing the claims once all of that has happened? Um, and finally, kind of avoiding refunds, um, handling that if you can get people happy and get them in a, in a good state and process promptly, then hopefully you won't have to resort to doing that. There are some Benefits, of course, that are a little bit harder to put the price on. So for instance, your reputation. So each unhappy person will then go and tell their friends who will then kind of tell their friends. So it has a knock-on effect on your reputation in the marketplace. And customer service. Um, if you've been proactively given information that you need, you've been dealt with in a timely manner, it just all adds to how good a customer service you feel that you've had with a particular provider. So, so just to um, to talk about a specific case there, so when we are talking to new airlines, we often run through a return on investment um, calculation with them. We've got a very good model that we can use to map that out. And one of the sort of really interesting cases is uh, flight status notifications. So this differs um, with a lot of the calculations we normally do. So for something like a uh, schedule change or a reaccommodation where we're going out to the customer and telling them about a reaccommodation solution that's been found, getting them to accept or decline it, and then you know updating the PRs and clearing it. Where with that, where we're looking for sort of 80% automation um, for that type of feedback, where the, the ROI is basically it's saving that manual effort, it's saving those uh, members of staff time who, as Neil said, might be better off taking sales calls or doing something or dealing with those really unusual customers that do actually need some manual intervention. Um, a really interesting one though that is more around the reputation and uh, competitive advantage and that kind of thing is flight status notification. So we monitor this quite a lot um, and we've done a lot of research to find out what the impact of not telling your passengers what's going on might be. So with flight status notifications, what we're talking about is change to departure time, change to arrival time, gate changes, cancellations, those live during the operational window type of updates. Um, 
what we've looked at here is uh, what is the potential risk of not telling people that information. Um, in here, we've worked out that out of all the people that, um, when we look at the ROI first of all, it's, it's important to look at you mostly look at your direct booking rate. Um, when you're looking at the ROI, obviously being able to contact them is really important. If there aren't any customer contact details in that booking, they shouldn't form part of your ROI calculations. We do a lot of work to append data out of the frequent flyer program and the CRM and that kind of thing. But ultimately, you're only ever looking at how many customers you can contact, not how many customers you can carry. Um, we've worked out that out of everyone uh, who gets delayed uh, by a significant amount, if they aren't informed, you're looking at about 39% of customers avoid the cu will avoid flying with you for two years after a bad experience. 54% of those will share that bad experience and try and influence uh, five or more people not to fly with you as well. If you factor all that in and look at your um, at various costs, like your profit per passenger, the cost of sale, um, all of that kind of thing, you're talking about quite a considerable amount of money. Um, and particularly when actually wiring up the automation to give updates with some nice sensible rules so that you don't over-inform, under-inform, that kind of thing can really, you know, the, it doesn't cost anywhere near the sort of money to set this process up. It's relatively straightforward, but it can save you a lot of effort. When you think um, this doesn't factor in things like how hard e-commerce tried to sell that ticket in the first place or how competitive your route is, your competitors doing this. It also has a knock on effect around ancillary sales and things like that, where because of the loss of um, trust uh, with your customers, because these things aren't automated, it really impacts the engagement rate you get with uh, more promotional style communications and uh, you know how you can cross and upsell. It's really important to build the basics of trust in with your customers so they know you're going to stay in touch with them. And you can't really do that in a manual sense with this type of notification because obviously the scale of it is far beyond anything you could manually trigger or manage yourself. Thanks, Al. Um, so during looking at the ROI, um, you would have had a look at your process and, and kind of got a bit of a handle on it. Um, when you're actually planning for the automation, um, you need to understand a bit more about the kind of nature of each task that makes that up. So one of the things that we um, advise our customers to do is to look at whether or not you can write a script for a human to follow a process. These are think tasks which are really ripe for automation. Um, do you have a spreadsheet that's driving the process? Are the people involved just copying it from one system to another? Again, this is something that computers are made to do. Um, with APIs now, we can zap data around the globe quite easily. Does a particular task take judgment? So the automation might not be doing everything on its own, but it might be doing these tasks that we were talking about before, like the scripted tasks, passing data around, and then actually providing a checkpoint where a human being can make that judgment call, make the decision, um, and make sure everything runs smoothly. Also, two other factors we always also look at are, does the output need to be timely? For example, um, check-in reminders, um, quite close to the actual check-in window. You wouldn't want that being slipped for one day or someone forgetting to send it. Um, and does it need to run constantly? Again, computers don't go to sleep, hopefully not very often. Um, so they can sit there in the background running these processes. Kind of looking ahead, um, don't be afraid to apply the 80-20 rule. Um, you don't have to automate everything in the first go. If you can automate kind of 80% of your effort away and get dealing with that more complicated 20%, then that's quite quite a good successful rate usually. Um, also look at cutting over from manual support to your automation. Look at how that's gonna work. Make sure you've got enough staff to deal with that and that you've got proper training. Um, once you have then cut over, Look at what auditing you get out of the process. Um, and again, get the activity that requires the timely human interaction to humans as quickly as possible, basically. In that 80%, make sure that you're getting that 20% dealt with by human beings as quickly as possible. Thinking more long term in your business and the people that work with you, um, where do you actually want to invest your human skills? 
Um, if there's a particular skill set that isn't going to be needed in the long term, then again, that's a great area to automate, get that knowledge codified um, and running. Um, is a particular process going to scale rapidly? It might not be, this might help you prioritise um, which particular tasks you actually tackle in your automation. Because if they're going to stay static as your business grows, you can maybe look at other ways where as your business grows, you do need to um, tackle different automation. Um, so, Al. So, yeah, so the next bit we're going to um, discuss between us really is the levels of automation. And I think this is a really interesting topic because we go to a lot of trade shows and we listen to a lot of talks and people talk about AI, machine learning, chatbots, things like that. And they talk about it like it's all one thing. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there about what the different levels of automation or AI are because there isn't all one thing. It's not one standard. There are definitely steps to this. Um, why that I think that's important is because so you don't expect too much of automation too quickly. You don't get too daunted by the idea of uh, some crazy robot running off and running your company for you. Um, you've got to work it out in stages and you've got to understand when people talk about automation, what type of automation they're talking about. Um, because obviously they're not all the same. So we're going to run through this in levels. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of ask you guys what you think of these different levels. Mm. But, you know, level one is just some basic business rules and workflows. So this is probably where a lot of people are uh, with a lot of their processes uh, using things like spreadsheets and, you know, yeah. to-do lists and maybe workflows stuck on a wall. You know, if this happens, follow this process. Sure. And I think this is like a really important first step. I mean, if you're doing everything manually at the moment, it'll be quite a leap to go to a full AI solution. So um, you need to really work through, document what you currently do, make sure that it's well understood in the business and you can kind of automate those simple business rules. Um, it is amazing how many businesses kind of lose track over time of what their business rules are because they're in people's heads. It's kind of more kind of tacit organisational knowledge. So great first step, get things written down, get a very simple automation in. I think it's good to get everyone on the same page as well. Yeah. So you get everyone from cross functions all together in one room and trying to extract it out of their minds um, and mapping it all out visually onto a wall is a really useful process anyway, because you'll find gaps as you go through that. Um, I have to say. And perhaps, you know, cross-reference it with best practices that you can find from other sources. I have to say, actually, we, we, so we, as part of our setup process with um, most airlines, is we will um, go and do like a, a, a workflow workshopping process with them where we get, you know, stakeholders from the customer contact centre and from operations and, you know, control centre and customer experience mm. and say, look, what it, when when you do your summer rescheduling, what what happens next? What do you do? And it's it's really interesting actually because people do have processes, as you say. Sometimes it's in someone's head, or yeah. it might be written as a flowchart, or or something like that. But you realise how complicated it is to maintain consistency in those workflows because it, you know it, how different people interpret those workflows can change. You know, people leave the company, new people start. You've got to constantly keep uh, re-educating people about what the right yeah. thing to do under those circumstances are. I mean, I've seen people who do queue management by sitting down with a big form feed print out and really in a pen and go and check and find out if there's stuff missing at P and R's. And you can just see where it's that gap between the process and the and the, the you know where the data is being held and everything. And it's a yeah. that's that's the where you can see the most obvious gains of you know someone spending hours checking to make sure that all the payments have been completed or. Stuff's yeah. on the queue, you know. And anybody who does that or comes into the business needs to be trained on what those rules are and what they're looking for. Um, so yeah, getting your processes written down is a is a brilliant first step. So okay, so I'm assuming lots of people out there have got um, you know some some or more of those things. So then we move into sort of simple automation. So this is um, the sort of next step on. Um, where we're getting a kind of an effect of AI, but not actually AI. Yeah. So previously we might have had, say, like where well, you've got your business rules written down, they might be in a template, which someone then triggers manually based on an event happening. 
Um, here we're starting to look at very simple automation of, um, of say, schedule changes or other notifications like we've got there with pre-departure communications and itineraries, where the process of actually triggering it is automated itself. So things arrive on a queue or a date trigger triggers the um, notification. All the business rules are in the templates and no humans need to do that. Um, and basically just monitoring the performance. You're making sure that things are running smoothly, picking up errors. Um, but the actual basic day-to-day -day running is, is taken care of by the automation. I think, you know, when I've seen airlines come out of the other side of the workshopping process where they do write down all these workflows, often it's the first time anyone's had a complete set of all of the workflows they need for something like schedule changes or, you know, uh, rear comms or even if like status notifications. And it's really good to get everyone to agree on one process. Mm. But once you've mapped that into automation, if you need to tweak that process based on feedback you get from the reports, it means you're just literally updating that process slightly or moving some of the timings or changing the template. But what you haven't got to then do is go and rebrief everybody, who, all of those stakeholders yeah. and everybody who works mm. in the customer call centre and change all the charts on the wall and everything because that is all inside that that you know that automated system. And I think one of the things we also find with this level is that some of those nice to have communications that might have gone out or or, or bits of the messaging um, are actually now just in the process and done consistently because you're always getting through to people spikes in demand don't make too much difference um, so this is where your your customer service can have a little bit of an uplift and um, without too much more effort i think that's an interesting yeah. point actually don't think that when we talk about automation it is it because we keep showing pictures of robots and stuff in this but it isn't a cold inhuman process that's the paradox of this that actually you as you workshop this you build in loads of empathy to it so you're always you know, is this person traveling with children? Are they going through a particularly awkward airport? You know, how bad has their day been to date? Is this the third disrupted flight in a row? What time of the morning is it? All of those things can be factored into the personalization. So actually what you're providing in an automated way mm -hmm. is that personalized, really empathetic, really concierge style service, which maybe you wouldn't have time to do if you were trying to do it live and do it manually. But because yeah. you can think about it, you can go, okay, let this person is yeah i think that's really important actually even from a airline branding point of view so yes you can pull in all the data about who is traveling and putting it into context but also the language that you use if you're doing it manually you're relying on your staff having a consistent tone of voice which they may or may not have mm. whereas if it is all effectively templated and like neil says talking to having the right triggers in place that automates the process each and every time it happens then you get a consistent sort of service from that airline. You understand what you get. And I think that provides a lot of reassurance for passengers and like, you know, the whole customer service and understanding what you're paying for is really important. Mm. It's, I think it's using the, the people skills and the empathy you already have. I know like some of the best input we get at workshops are people who are actually sit on the phone sometimes mm. and go, yeah. people really worry about this. And we go, okay, well, under those circumstances, we'll include that extra information. Yeah. Like I say, you know, if you're a, a family traveling through an airport and maybe you don't travel quite so often, you know, you need a whole different set of information about baby change facilities, kids mm. play areas, that kind of stuff. If you're a business traveler, you don't need all that stuff, but it should be the automation to drive that dynamic content to make sure that it's, it feels like you're being spoken to specifically and the airline understands your circumstances. Yeah. There's quite a few, um, even from a financial point of view, the automation of schedule changes and also the abandoned basket, we've got quite a lot of insight now and, and stats from customers that illustrate financially what benefit that has had on their business. So, JetBlue automate up to is it seventy eight percent of their schedule changes now without actually having to interface with the UI or to you know do anything manually at all. So, so really it shows the effectiveness of taking away that otherwise quite laborious task from the staff for the staff to do, and making sure that they focus all their attentions on providing the human touch where it's needed, whether that be in a completely different area to do with disruption, or like you said, you know, if you've got a disabled child who may need of a more, you know, human uh, service, then they they have the time mm. to actually invest in that. Absolutely, and it 
sometimes you might look at these, we're talking about prioritizing automation from a business case point of view. Some things in here are like really easy wins, like the abandoned basket stuff and pre-departure communications. If you want to build a business case internally for this kind of stuff, you only need to plug in like an automated abandoned basket routine where, yeah. you know, is it like something like a third of everyone you send it to will open it and half of those will then complete their booking. That stuff will pay for the rest of these projects comfortably. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, you know, you can prioritize things based on the business benefit and what's going to be seen as the biggest wins, you know, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward thing. So moving from simple automation up to complex automation, um, we're still not really talking artificial intelligence here, are we? We're still talking. No. So here we're just talking more complex business rules, things that happen a kind of faster pace, so you don't get as much opportunity for that human oversight. And um, for example, chatbots mm, aren't really AI, but they they are kind of a complex series of of business rules that will interact with each other. Um, but even things like boarding passes with all the regulatory kind of concerns and have to be sent out quite quickly from that initial trigger. Um, it's actually quite complex automation, all the different routes that you can have through that. Um, so I think once you start to get into this level, you've actually got your start a lot of payback from your automation. Um, things that it probably wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do necessarily with with humans um so for example with the boarding passes you might actually kind of have your automation as the um the passengers doing the checking online um, um do it that way and then you can have kind of simpler automation on the validation when they actually go there to see whether or not they've got documents and ask them for them um but here much better customer service much more timely um, things going on that's a good, a good example of that it goes back to um rachel's point at the beginning about like increased pressure on airports and traveler numbers and things like that i mean we know most airports are already at capacity regardless mm. of you know them doubling over time i'm assuming mean, i don't know what it's like everywhere else but i know in england they're not just going to keep sticking runways on each because it <laughs> causes them enough trouble getting that's this one but you know things like checking is really interesting so swiss um use us for auto checking and um, sending out home printed bag tags and allowing customers to completely self-serve. Now, not all customers want to do that, but Swiss are taking it as a, a real advantage to their customers. If they can self-serve, they can. So they don't have to queue up. They can just go. They've got their bag tag on the bag already. They work in there. They know they have filled out all the right details in their booking because we've checked that already and got them to fill it in. They go, they check in their bag, they get an automated um, you know, electronic baggage receipt that gets sent to them. So it's not a sticky bit of paper on a little bit of paper they can lose. Mm. Um, and then they're straight through. And that means the people who do need human interface, because there will still be people who, you know, maybe you haven't traveled in 10 years, you've never seen any of this technology before. Mm. So you might want to go and talk to somebody, you know, like your nan is probably going to want to go and stand at a desk and actually check to make sure they've got everything they need, right? But that's fine because they then don't have to queue up. In fact, with a lot of airports now with self-service, they've got rid of standing behind a desk for some of the self-service. And you've got like customer service people just sort of roaming around in front and helping people and chatting yeah. to kids and that kind of stuff. It really goes to show how automation can free up pressure on, yeah. you know, on, on specific bottlenecks and just try and keep it so that you can add the customer service on top without it being a massive, you know, I think one, you're, one yeah. customer after another over and over again. You know? There will always be your early adopters. There will always be people who are laggards, who are nervous about any new technology. And I think it's about normalising that whole mm. that whole behaviour. Do you know what I mean? So you see automation outside of the travel industry every day and people are used to it. And it's just about taking that mentality and applying it to the travel industry. People you know certainly younger generation will expect automation through and through they don't necessarily put silos in terms of oh, i'm now in the travel industry therefore my expectations should be different to if i was in the retail space or the banking Absolutely. space so i think you don't call up amazon to confirm your order exactly you? <laughs> yeah. you don't get a piece of paper that says yeah but i mean I, I do and i you know i always think with and if there are gaps in that, you know, and what people in the step between being an, an early adopter and being a laggard, you can always automate a little video that shows you what to do when you get to the self-service tool so that people don't feel 
confused when they get there, you know? Yeah. That, all of that empathy can still be in all of these but processes. The more that they it see it on a day-to-day -day basis, on. they'll just get used to it and yeah. it'll become reassuring that it's not going to fall down when they use it. Mm. And it is quite nice, to your point, Al, that the, the desks are kind of being broken down, the barriers between the customer service agents and the actual customers. Mm -hmm. It just feels a lot more natural and kind of informal and friendlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we're getting to the more advanced stuff. Um, well, I think this is fair to say in uh, getting more uh, more looking to the future rather than yeah. what is currently being done a lot at the moment. <laughs> but using sort of predictive uh, automation and AI and that kind of thing. Yeah. So there are um, kind of certain things that you need to be able to to make predictions based on on past data. Um, kind of one of the main things is that your prediction doesn't actually change um, the data that you that you're looking to make the next prediction on um, but also having some kind of cycle so the travel industry you can kind of make predictions based on time of year and routes and things like that so you do have um, a lot of contextual information that's going to drive what happens um, and this is really where a lot of the hype and the buzzwords in the past couple of years about big data and machine learning and deep learning kind of all sit around here. So actually, as you're building up to this level, um, you should really be building up as well your analytical capabilities, so the data you collect about your processes um, so that you can then use past behavior to try and predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, so, for instance, um, whether or not a certain route has pushed back on, on schedule changes, whether or not a certain type of customer, maybe certain SSRs actually indicate something about them that, that determines how they're going to react. Um, so that's all information that you can start to draw out once you've, you've got your process automated, you're routinely collecting that data. I think that's, you know, I, I've seen some pretty scary applications of this recently. There are companies out there that will try and tell you whether your flight is likely to be late. Mm. Well, before anyone knows whether it will be. And most of those companies are the ones that handle refunds. Sorry, <laughs> everyone, completely. But, you know, they're saying if you it, this flight is likely to get cancelled, you want to rebook it. That's not going to be very helpful from an airline point of view if people start throwing rebooking requests. Likewise, if all of these automation processes that sit outside of the airline are driving claims and things like that. You need to be ready to handle that. Mm. Um, whether that's being able to predict your routes and avoid those disruptions in the first place, or at the very least being able to triage those claims as they come through. But you know, it's, a lot of this stuff could be really useful. I know we've been quite keen on our system looking back at the data at some point in the future mm. and suggesting which messages you should send and, and when you should time them and what content you should put in there based on previous success. Yeah, uh, you know. and also which sentence channel to use based on how far out that, that changes. These are all things that we can kind of start to look at and see how successful they were in the past and, and make a, a prediction for the future. I think it would be useful to have those analytics even from a, a new airline going into a new route. What channels do you use using all the data that we've collated from every one of our 50 odd customers? like? what channels work best and what scenario for which markets, that kind of thing. Mm. I think this is where the, you know, I, I know everyone made a big deal out of big data and all that analysis and stuff. And I, I think everyone's getting quite good at collecting all the data now. I'm still not really sure anyone's quite sure how to analyze it or then get no. that to prompt action. But I mean, we'll get there, I'm sure, you know. It's not, I don't, you know, everything we've talked about so far in this hasn't actually involved in all, a lot of that data analytics. It's mostly the human element of going, mm. Well, what would this customer need to know at this point if that happened to them? You know, that's not um, too mad. I mean, we always give the example on uh, pre-departure communications of we can API out the booking and the weather information to someone like Musement, and they come back with the right thing to do in that city if it rains and you're traveling with children. None of that is actually AI or big data analysis or anything else. It's just empathy. It's just a, a straightforward workflow. It's a, yeah. If it's raining in Paris and you've got two small children, are you going to want to wake them up to the Eiffel Tower in the rain? Probably not. Don't mm. suggest that. You know? <laughs> it's not, it doesn't like, you, don't, you shouldn't be uh, intimidated by these things. You can achieve a lot without getting anywhere near complex and predictive stuff. 
Yeah, and there are actually even quite simple predictive models that have come from, say, the power industry, um, which has kind of very circular usage in um, weekly cycles, say, um, and or seasonal cycles that can be used um, in other applications. For instance, we look at our own user interface um, usage to see how that might change um, in the next week, um, just to kind of make sure that we're not going to trip over any kind of um, overheads. Um, so yeah, these other industries are doing kind of quite low key things in terms of how advanced they are, um, but they are very powerful tools. So, so far, not so scary, no more so. Um, so, picture on the right is me with too much coffee. Yeah. So, um, so, full out, I mean, full AI. Um, so, this is where we get into actual uh, artificial intelligence and all the things that everyone's worried about, <laughs> basically. But there's still, I mean, there are uses for it. Yeah, and I think we are quite a long way away from this level of um, AI. So anybody who's worried that all of our jobs are going to be re replaced, um, I think we're safe for a few years yet. Um, but yeah, the next kind of logical step is that the computers can teach themselves what they need to look at and how to automate it. And um, all of your data is linked up. Predictive analytics actually are then used as a trigger. Um, but as I said, I think one of the key barriers at the moment in the state of the art is a general AI. So we're getting quite good now at creating very specific AIs for particular purposes, say like playing chess or driving cars. But you couldn't use the AI that will drive your Tesla around to play chess or vice versa because they've been trained for one task. Um, so that's one of the reasons why full AI is uh, quite a way off. It's not, I mean, you can see how it would work though. I mean, you, you know, it's the thing, I think the thing where AI is very good is it can do a lot of, you can, if you tell it the parameters, you can get it to do a lot of AB testing very, very quickly yeah. and change what it does very fast. It can do that much, much quicker than a human could. It's just, it's, you know, it still takes a lot of human intervention to stop it shooting off in a random direction to mm. end up with like, the answer to everything being 42 you need to know what it's keep a grip on what it's for like so don't 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 worry about ai just yet not in this context anyway <laughs> so yeah just to to wrap up really some other factors to consider as you're going on that journey up through the automation levels um, obviously if you're making it easier for things to happen um there's also security risk to that because the bad things can happen a lot easier as well so you need to be kind of mindful of that um also aim to use ready-made solutions because you don't want to be investing the time in creating your automation framework or your integrations you actually really want to concentrate on your business rules um which brings me on to my next point if you solve specific problems It'll be a lot easier to automate and you'll get a lot more payback quicker um, than if you've got very vague problems. And that might be OK. You might have a business program that is looking at vague problems, but it should really be looking at what specific things you can automate. Yeah, it's always, we always suggest you start with whatever is the biggest pain yeah. you know, and then work your way back from there. You don't have to do all this in one go. You can take it off bite by bite. You know? Yeah. Um, and again, look at any human oversight required. Um, and don't forget to put that back into your ROA calculator um, because you're probably not going to get rid of all the humans um, in any particular process. Um, finally, just to touch a bit more on um, metrics, um, as I said, you should be collecting analytics as you're going through, um, and these will help you spot that next big problem that I was talking about. Um, so as you knock one off, you can then move on to the other. Um, you can also use these metrics to inform whether or not what your next step should be. So it might actually be to simplify your business model. It might be to write a new script to help staff deal with the problem. 
um, or a mixture of both. And then just kind of go around again, applying the 80-20 rule, going for the biggest payback that you can. I know with our, um, our longer term customers, so we've got customers who've been using the system for 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years. Um, um, what they did was they started off with their biggest problem, like schedule change or something like that. They automated that and they went, okay, can we look at other stuff around check-in or you know, flight status? And now they've eventually got to a point where they're just, it's almost a time and efficiency exercise. You just walk around the office and you see someone doing a, a task and you think, mm -hmm. they do that every day? Do they follow the same process every day? Can we map out that workflow and just get someone else to do it so I can use that talent for something more useful? Yeah. Um, you know, or just reduce your own meds if you need to. And I think spotting those processes to automate and go through the process of automating them is a skill that you learn. And as you go through That's it so. once, yeah, then it becomes a lot easier the next time. So um, just some top tips really for the future. Um, we've heard from Neil and from Al, customer experience really is your opportunity to be different from your competitors. And that might be your own customer experience that you define yourselves in line with your brand. Um, but certainly if you don't put CX at the core of your business, then chances are you won't be performing as well as your competitors. Um, another tip is around customer demand. Obviously, we know even ourselves, we are becoming increasingly more demanding. We expect far more personalization. We expect information at our, finger at our fingertips at all times. Um, it's really trying to understand how you can deliver on those expectations um, today, but also understanding what they're going to be in the future and making sure that you adapt to that. Um, it's really important to remember, of course, every business is different. You need to think hard and consider what level of automation will work for you and what that might be today may well be different to what you want in the future. So do the baby steps first and then just build on that and, you know, get your footing and feel more comfortable with what automation can give you. And then really what the world is your oyster and you can automate as many processes as you want. Um, if you want to run through any of the data that we've gone through during this webinar on the ROI calculator, for example, um, and just to get a feel for what benefit automation can give you, then of course do get in touch. Um, that's probably with you, Al. Yep. Um, which leads nicely on to uh, the last step, uh, what next? So um, we'd just like to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, if you are interested in um, talking to us about how we can help you with this kind of thing, obviously, you know, we feel very strongly about it and we've helped a lot of um, airlines with very um, unique needs uh, to fill out their automation. Most airlines do work um, in different ways to each other. So it's a very bespoke process. Um, we also, as I said, a lot of different notifications and workflows. These result out in lots of multi-channel notifications. Um, it's very stable, it's very reliable, um, you can handle very large volumes. Um, and as I said, it's a very bespoke solution. Don't feel that you have to fit a one size fits all with this process because we are replicating things that might be done by managed by your call centers, by processes that have evolved over a number of years, by things that are specific to the market you work in or the culture that your um, your customers are from or the channels they prefer, all, all of these things can be done. Um, the whole point of this is to, to create that efficiency, to build in that um, personalization so you improve customer service, but it takes you less effort to get there. Um, that then builds that trust and it means your customers will want you to communicate with them, which obviously then is really good for, you know, for um, increasing your cross and upsell opportunities. Um, if you're handling all of this stuff really well, regardless of the volume, regardless of the disruption that customer is going through, they're going to be much more inclined to respond to um, personalised offers and that kind of thing. Um, so if you are interested in getting in touch, contact details are there on the screen. Um, more than happy to talk to anyone. I think we should be releasing the ROI calculator for the flight status notification online soon, so you can have a play around with that. But if you want to look at the bigger ROI module or talk about any of the things we've discussed today, then please do get in touch. But um, that's it, basically. So thank you very much to uh, my co-hosts. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and we'll see you on the next webinar.